Hey, uh, my name is Michael Cummings, work with BlazePod. It's one of their uh, ambassadors and master trainers. And I have the awesome opportunity to host these webinars, which I get super excited about. Um, so one of the things I wanted to let you guys know is um, uh, you'll all be getting an email afterward uh, with uh, contact information on how to reach uh, uh, Kevin and George or Dr. Wilk and Dr. Davies. Um, so we'll send that out afterward, um, which, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, as far as questions go, uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, I'm going to be the guy that looks at those questions and will interrupt these fine gentlemen to, uh, uh, to ask them the questions. Cause we really want this to be interactive. These guys are professors, speakers, educators, and, um, that really, really just here to, um, to help answer those questions. Um, I'm sure all of you know, um, if you do not, uh, we have um, Dr. Physical Therapy here, uh, Dr. Kevin Wilk, um, and he's currently the uh, clinical director um, of Champion Sports Medicine. He's, he's out there in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and uh, man, the, 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 the bio is long. Just, just Google that name and, and you'll see. I don't want to get too far into it, but um, we are, we're Super grateful that uh, that you're here, Kevin. Uh, so appreciate what you do for BlazePod, and moreover, how you use it as a tool to help you know ameliorate injury and get people feeling better. Uh, no, we also have. Uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure to be with you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we also have um, Dr. George Davies with us. Um, he right now, uh, well, I guess for the last, you know, lots of years, he's the professor of uh, physical therapy over at Southern Georgia University, um, where he's running the uh, program, the PT program in, uh, in Savannah, Georgia. So uh, again, uh, any information on him, go ahead and Google that name, because there is a laundry list of accomplishments that that he has had and made um, in this in this realm. And it was kind of a, 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 a dream of mine to be able to get him and Kevin together because, uh, you know, having dinner with George and just understanding and meeting with him a couple of times, everything that he's doing uh, as far as uh, research projects and, um, and validating uh, certain things, modalities in the field have just been incredible. And so, George, we're super grateful that you're here joining us as well. Thank you. And Thanks for the kind uh, invitation. <laughs> one of the cool things is I've been to the APTA shows and and a, and a lot of the other uh, physical therapy shows, and they 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 all know the both of you, and it it speaks volumes, and not just working with Blaze Pod, and not just you know the, a social media presence, but to, to be in this field for such a long time, helping, you know, athletes and gen pop and just everybody feel better um, is, is truly like what a, it's such a, such an awesome call. And I think the reason that, that everybody who is a physical therapist got into it. Um, and so, yeah, really, really it speaks uh, volumes on the, the two of you and what you guys have, the legacy that you've created and, and will leave in this space. The quick run of show, uh, in about 30 seconds, I'm going to turn the time over to, uh, to, to Dr. George Davies, and he's going to run us through a um, bit of research on how he looks at uh, specific body parts that we're going to focus on today. And then um, he'll uh, turn the time over to Kevin to kind of show us the application, the applied version of that. So without further ado, I want to appreciate everyone for being on. Please ask questions right there, click on that little button, ask us a question and I will um, get them your information or I'll uh, ask that question for you. But uh, George, I'm gonna turn the time over to you right now. Okay, thank you. You see my presentation? It's coming up. I want to make one comment. Um, go uh, make sure that you're asking questions and not raising hands. No, no questions. We're not going to take any um, verbal questions right now. So just ask the questions. Thank you. 
Screen okay? Yes, sir. All right. Once again, on behalf of Kevin and myself, we'd like to thank uh, Blaze Pods for the kind invitation. I would also like to personally thank Kevin for his willingness to participate. It's always an honor and a privilege to do uh, programs with Kevin. I am George Davies, professor at Georgia Southern University in Savannah, Georgia. And my task is to initially just start it off and talk a little bit more about the testing first. And uh, particularly, we've recently completed some reliability testing of the blaze pods for the upper extremity neurocognitive reactive testing for both the closed chain and open chain positions. So we've had an interest in this for quite some time. And as you can see, Kevin and I have done several studies together. And this is one where Kevin was a senior author that we published on criteria for return to sport. And then again, just recently, literally within the last couple of weeks, we just published this article on IJSPT. And again, uh, just shows the willingness of Kevin and I to work together to really promote more research. Uh, Brian Riemann, who's one of the researchers at the university where I work, also uh, contributed. But at any rate, what we're gonna do is talk about, again, as I said, the reliability. And we've had several other projects in, uh, in the works. This study, again, neurocognitive testing for the upper extremity and looking at some other criteria for return is also in review at the present time. Now, again, to put everything in perspective, this is a very commonly cited study, the 2022 Byrne Consensus on Shoulder Injury Prevention and Return to Sport. What they did is they came up with a variety of different test protocols for different sporting activities. What is interesting is the lead author on that article indicates there's lack of quality evidence and an absence of quality evidence with no single test or battery of tests, which is really the best to provide ecological validity, meaning that we don't really have any specific tests that really replicate some of the activities that are going on in sporting activities. As a matter of fact, there's 23 tests that are uh, described in that particular article. And what's interesting, all of those are predetermined proactive volitional muscle activation tests in a controlled manner. None of them are reactive multitask tests that simulate the reactive responses that are required in sporting activities. If we look at the burn consensus when return to sport, again, they talk about return to participation, return to sport and return to performance. But over here on the side, which some people have missed, it's again, we need to use open skills and reactive requirements. So is that really this whole idea of this neurocognitive reactive multitask testing? Is that what we're missing in our testing and criteria for return to sport? So with that as a backdrop, we know in the shoulder, we know it well in the knees over the last decade, but we now are realizing in the shoulder as well that when you injure the shoulder, it's also a brain injury. Consequently, we have to test the brain. So that segues into really what I'm going to focus on in the next few minutes is just talking about some of the reliability testing that we've done. These studies were just presented at our APTA national meeting in San Diego a few months ago. So we did one on the open kinetic chain testing and one on closed kinetic chain testing. The purpose of the studies were to provide, establish the reliability of the neurocognitive testing of the upper extremity using the blaze pods. Again, our hypotheses were that there would be moderate to high reliability for both of those testing situations. So we had IRB approval from the university and we divided them into, again, the closed kinetic chain or the collision contact sporting group. And then the second area we'll talk about briefly will be the open kinetic chain or the overhead sporting activities. So again, and I'm not gonna belabor all the details, but we had the subjects to uh, warm up, randomize the testing. They had orientation sessions, and then we had them do the testing, test, retest trials, and then we did, uh, again, ICCs for statistical analysis. So again, if we, whoops, if we look at the actual testing, this is the traditional closed kinetic chain upper extremity stability test. The reason I'm starting with this this simple test has more references than any other in the literature. But now, again, here's how we turn it into the, again, the neurocognitive part where they do the reactive, where they touch the blaze pods. And they basically do that from the standpoint of having the neurocognitive reactive. 
we do it with a single light response and we did it with multiple light responses. And again, to summarize it, we found the ICCs were between moderate to almost perfect in agreement. The actual number of touches, the ICCs and the MDCs are all listed. Now, likewise for the overhead sport using an open kinetic chain position, we use the ASH format. So again, the overhead flexion position, scaption, abduction on the side, and then we also did a 90-90 position. And again, that was to replicate some of the positions that the ASH uh, test has demonstrated. So there's the positions on the wall for the open kinetic chain testing. And again, the same thing, the patients or the sorry subjects had an orientation, randomized, then test, retest, repeatability. And as an example, here's just demonstrating the individual doing, again, single light responses. And we do one arm at a time, so dominant or non-dominant, or obviously if it's a patient, we would do the uninvolved side first and then the involved side. Now, after we do single light, then again, the next thing we would do is progress to multiple lights. So here again, the person is being distracted by multiple lights going on simultaneously, and the subject has to pick out this specific light that we're using as the model, in this case, blue. Now from there, we go into, again, alternating arm reactions with a single light response. So here, again, he's going to alternate the arms with one light at a time. And then again, to make it more distracting, now as you'll see, we're now going to have all the lights coming on for further distraction, trying to somewhat simulate a sporting event because when you're again, so an opponent, you're looking at the jersey or the color or whatever, and you have to respond to the subject. So at any rate, there's an example of how we did the, again, multi-task with multiple lights, neurocognitive reactive testing. One more time, whenever you start with a new type of test, again, we have to establish reliability. One more time again, all the results were between moderate to almost perfect for ICCs. You can see the number of touches, the ICCs, and the actual MDCs that were elicited. So therefore, in conclusion, the purpose of the original studies were to establish reliability of the blaze pods for open and closed kinetic chain neurocognitive testing. They supported our original hypotheses that there was moderate to high reliability for those. And again, we know there's a need for neurocognitive reactive multitask reactive testing. And this study has essentially established the ecological validity. Furthermore, it's the first study to establish the reliability of this type of testing, which is a need uh, because I think it's still one of the missing links. Clinical implications, because we did find good reliability, performing the neurocognitive reactive testing with the blaze pods with the closed and open chain. Therefore, we can use that for criterion-based assessment for rehab, as well as progression for criteria for return to sport. So once again, I would like to thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. And here's Kevin. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, share screen. Mm -hmm. George's got to give it up. George, that was fantastic, as always. Thanks so much for that intro <laughs> and uh, great information, as uh, as you've always done as far as uh, data collection and uh, showing us the way as far as some of these tests and things of that nature. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen. George, did you close out your screen? I did. Okay. It should, should be off. All right, there you go. You okay? Yep. There we go. You see it fine, I hope? Yes, sir. Looking good. good. So I'm gonna take, uh, take the ball and run with it as George set it up uh, very, very nicely. We've collaborated for quite a few years on things and, and so forth. So uh, really appreciate everything he's, he's taught me through the years to say the least. One of the first courses I went to was a George Davies course. 
So I'm a lot younger than George, but uh, he's, he's <laughs> talked a lot through the years, to say the least. So my, my task is really to uh, discuss the application. I'm going to talk about upper extremity, a little bit of lower extremity. We probably use more lower extremity with the blaze pods. Ironically, I was just thinking about that, but some of the studies that uh, we've done recently are, are somewhat unique and so forth and exercises with the upper extremity. So this is where I'm at in Birmingham, Alabama. The upper left is uh, our medical building that I'm in right now. So uh, it's lunchtime here. Also uh, work at ASMI, our American Sports Medicine Institute, which is our biomechanics uh, lab and also education. So uh, proud to be part of uh, ASMI as well. So uh, if you want information on things, uh, ASMI.org is a great site as well. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about upper extremity application and talk about the rationale why we use neurocognitive. I think George did a great job with that already. Uh, some of the specific drills, if you will and also talk about a few of the objective tests for the upper extremity. Uh, and I know we only have, you know, it's an hour webinar. We could probably do this for three hours, but I'm gonna show a, a variety of examples. As, as George showed, this is where we started uh, a while back using blaze pods on the wall. As you see here, there's a gentleman who's looking for the target with distraction colors. We've tried to mount them on different surfaces as you probably all did through these learning curves. And then uh, blaze, pod, blaze Pod was so great to come up with the uh, reactive intelligence wall. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a, a football player rehabbing a shoulder that's unstable. And he's basically looking at target colors and we'll show a variety of these types of activities. Here, the same individual a little bit later in his rehab, I'm throwing a ball to him. He's got to locate the target, tap it, turn back around. So. Obviously, we don't throw the ball right to him each time. It's to the sides, low, high, and just try to get him moving and dynamic. George mentioned, we want to be reactive. And that's the best part of Blaze Pods is it's reactive, it's interactive, it's adaptable, and it's also very engaging. Yeah, get it going, get it going. Here's a basketball player who's uh, dribbling. Blazer, and it's a baby. red light, Blazer. he's dribbling with Deja his right vu. hand. When it's blue, he dribbles with his left. When it's green, he crosses get over. Get it going, get it going. Yes. Yeah, get it going, get it going. This is one movement that we started. We've done some testing uh, with George as well. And this is Zach Thomas, who was a PT fellow of mine a while back. And Zach is throwing a two pound ball up against the wall. Predetermined number of reps will do a stabilization. And at the same time, he has to locate, the, again, a target color, in this case, blue ignore the distracting colors, but the whole time dribble the ball in a throwing motion and have end range stabilization. So we're trying to bombard his central nervous system all at the same time. This is a drill we like a lot for endurance. This is a ball drops, it's called. That's a two pound ball. We have a sustained hold on the opposite side. And what he's doing is he's on the stability ball. So he's got to really engage his posterior chain, core of his body, and scapula posterior shoulder. So he's actually dropping and catching that ball. And then I'll say to him, hold, he's got to hold that static position. Uh, he locates the target colors again, and uh, got a lot going on all at the same time. Tough exercise. And we'll do this for time. So this would be a 30 second bout. So it really gets your shoulder going. And the other nice thing about this is many times we do it at the end of their treatment so that there's a fatigue aspect to it. And we're training that neurocognitive after fatigue. As you well know, you know, many of these individuals have injuries when they're fatigued, the mechanics break down. So we're trying to emphasize the endurance component. George, I know you're big on the, the fatigue and testing after fatigue and things of that nature. Have you looked at that much uh, in the lab? Yes, we've actually uh, completed a study on that that we're in the process of trying to write up right now. And we basically did a uh, traditional closed chain test and the traditional seated shot put test. Then we fatigued individuals, then we repeated the tests. And obviously as expected, they're all going to decrease. But my question was, what's the normal decrement that normally happens? So as an example, if I have a patient and we test them fresh, fatigue them, test them when they're fatigued, if they're within the normal limits of the fatigue drop, 
to me, that patient has done a good job with physical rehab for endurance and physical work capacity. I will discharge that patient. However, if we test a patient fresh, then we basically fatigue them and retest them. If they drop by more than the MDCs or the minimal detectable changes, then that's a patient that I think does not have the good physical work capacity or the endurance. And we've been able to establish what some of those MDCs are. So what you just said, Kevin, I think there's a lot of research, particularly more, I think, in the upper extremity that shows the effects of fatigue and how it affects shoulder and elbow injuries. And we need to look at that. And I like the idea, as you're uh, indicating, of a, combining the not only the reactive responses, but the reactive responses in the fatigue state. And I think that basically is probably the key to a lot of what we really need to all lead toward. So great yeah. job. Great job. I agree. I agree with you. And we've done some, some studies. Uh, our biomechanical people, Dr. Fleisig, Dr. Uh, Rafael Ashkamelia, have gone and looked at throwers in particular and, and saw that mechanics change once you get later in the game when you're a pitcher. <laughs> Speaking of that, here's a young man who is a baseball player, a little leaguer, and uh, he's doing some throws up against the wall. He had a little leaguer shoulder, as a matter of fact. That's what we were treating for, apophysitis. And he's doing his throws, and we want to start this very early. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the cool part about this, too, using Blaze Pod, is, you know, the first thing that happens after he gets done is, well, how many targets did I hit? You know, what's the record? What did I get last time? You know, I mean, it's engaging and it's it's contagious in a way that people love it. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it kind of breaks the mold of kind of the traditional exercise, if you will. We still do the tradition, but we also, you know, bring this into the element as well. We also try to make it fun. Here's two different things. The one in the blue shirt is a baseball player. The one in the red shirt is a football player. And they're competing and they have to hit their their target. The guy in the red hits the red. The guy in the blue hits the blue. The guy in the red's making a lot of noise too when he's doing it. But I mean these are just two two different colors, no distracting colors other than the targets. And we're looking at who gets the you know the greatest target hits, but at the same time I'm looking at how do they stabilize, how do they move, are they breaking down? You know, what's the core of their body? They're basically in a plank now for 30 seconds doing that activity. And you can see it's compelling. Even this guy's sitting here, you know, and he's just locked in, wants to see yeah. what goes on. And he's up next. They're great motivators. Absolutely. We always talk about the concept of functional rehab. Don't lose sight of the first three letters. If the patients aren't having fun, then it's not going to be a very effective treatment session. So that's one of the things with the blaze pods is not only does it affect the neurocognitive reaction, but the, the subjects and the patients that are doing it are having fun at the same time. And I think yep. that's a key element. Totally agree with you. And uh, I think that's how you retain people. That's how they finish their rehab and you take them to the yep. level that you think is necessary. So many times in the past before, quite honestly, and quite directly, before we started using blaze pods, I'd have patients who kind of burn out. You know what I mean? They kind of burn out of the rehab, even though I'm trying to change things up. I'm not quite sure it was as exciting as it is now. It, right. and it's engaging, rewarding. You know, each time you get done with a task, like with some of these that I'm showing, you get a score and you know exactly where you were in comparison to the other. It's, it's really changed my practice. And I'm not just saying that uh, because this is a blaze pod webinar. I'm being very, very direct and very, very honest about that. We know after a shoulder injury, like you see here, this person making a tackle and he dislocates his shoulder. Uh, we know multiple things happen when somebody dislocates their shoulder. It's not just one structure. Um, same thing here. This young lady reaches in and dislocates her shoulder. Shoulder pops out. Basketball player, which unfortunately we see quite frequently and certainly happens in other sports like lacrosse and soccer and you name it any any sports for that matter but we've learned that it's not just the capsule that's torn like with a bank heart lesion there could be bony changes that occur recurrence like a hill sacks lesion or even glenoid types of problems as you see here but interestingly and dr lepart showed this years ago that there is a proprioceptive deficit as a result and several people have studied that in the past Matter of fact, Dr. Lepart won a research award documenting that, won the year near award that particular year 
when he looked at after a dislocation, people's proprioception was altered. Since then, there's been studies looking at what's going on at the brain level uh, using MRI brain scans and looking at what's happened with the shoulder in particular, just like some of the great work that's been done at the knee with Dr. Grooms from Ohio University as well. But we found out that at the shoulder, the same effects occur. And it's interesting looking at some of these brain scans with either voluntary movement or passive movement, you're recruiting different areas of the brain when there is a deficit. And what's interesting about this particular study, they looked at individuals who had recurrent shoulder instability and the significance of that. And we all know that people who have injured their shoulder, many of these individuals try to make it without surgery and they have repeated dislocations. And you wonder why sometimes why the dislocations get easier. Is it just all structure or is it a question of losing that, that ability to stabilize, knowing where your joint is in space, but also being able to react effectively? And I think some people do well and some people don't. George, what's your, uh, what's your thoughts on studies like this? I know you've looked at these extensively. Yeah. No, I agree that uh, in the past, we always thought of the uh, injury as being the peripheral injury to the proprioceptors, the mechanoreceptors in the shoulder joint. Now, and basically we've learned from the knee and Dr. Grooms' work that it also has that uh, effects on the central nervous system in the brain. And I think that's where our rehab is ultimately heading, that there's even in some recent research did a presentation at a recent course on advances and uh, different parts of the brain are affected based on different types of injuries. And I think ultimately, as Kevin just pointed out, that if we're using passive motions or active movements, that we can actually facilitate the reorganization, if you will, or the facilitation of specific parts of the brain. Recent research even showed that, you know, there's certain areas that affects just the uh, cerebellum. There's others that affect the motor cortex. And uh, I think ultimately, I'm gonna say specialized medicine and specialized rehab is gonna start targeting specific exercises that uh, actually recruit that part of the brain. I think that's where we're heading. That to totally me is gonna be agree. the individualized type of medicine. Totally agree. And I, I think we'll get to the point in time where we'll actually be able to just wear a skull cap and actually yep. do our own brain scans with these movements. Um, we're close. There are a couple devices out there. It's very cost, uh, costly right now, but I think in time it will get better. But certainly this is the direction. And certainly like systems like the blaze pods allow you to target this and train those particular areas that these people are having neuro adaptations. And some of those adaptations are good. And some of those adaptations aren't so good. Uh, a while back, uh, fortunate enough to write a paper with George Davies and Mike Bagwell and Chris Arrigo, where we looked at how do we test shoulders, not only in the literature from the previous standpoint, but also what are we doing at this particular time, which was a couple of years ago, what are we doing right now? Now, what's interesting about that paper, that's in the International Journal of Sports BT, which is a free access journal. So you can take a look at this article, it was published in 2020. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's an interesting paper because it does a great job as far as review. But what's interesting is I'm actually very changed the way I test. <laughs> Three years later, I'm already, I do some of the tests as, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, but we've also added specific blaze pods tests in particular, which we didn't have in 2019 when we wrote this paper. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, Here's a gentleman who actually had elbow surgery to give me blue, go, how blue. quick we are to do things. And all quicker. he's doing is on the table go doing some reactive training. And we know that what George has shown years ago that not only when you're doing something like this from a strengthening standpoint, you have a physiologic overflow to the opposite side, but there's a neurophysiologic effect when you train one side to the other side. And that's what uh, I think George was alluding to. When someone gets injured, let's say a shoulder in this case, or, or in this gentleman's case, it was an elbow, we've always thought of it as being a peripheral localized effect. 
but excellent work has been done throughout the country and the world have shown you injure your right elbow, your left elbow is compromised, just like with an ACL on the knee, just like with your shoulder injury. And the reason for that is it's affecting your central nervous system. And so we try to get, get on this right away. Here's an interesting way of kind of maybe doing some shoulder rehab. Uh, we've got somebody on a BOSU ball stabilizing. It's a shoulder patient. Uh, one of our trainers, who's very handy, made this stand. Um, and we basically have mounted the blaze pods on the stand. And what he needs to recognize is if it's green, he throws with the left. And when it's red, he throws with the right. And he just alternates back and forth. So he's got to react. And we can do this with different masses. That's a two pound ball, but we can go up to four, six pounds. So he's bringing the core of the body into the equation. He also needs to throw. So he's got to react and catch, especially with a shoulder that may have been compromised with, with instability or subluxation. Gymnasts, we use a lot of closed gym yeah. exercises for gymnasts. And so I tend to see a lot of gymnasts. This is an elite gymnast uh, now on her way to college. At the time she was a high school. Uh, great plank there, great core control, doing a little bit of a step over, as you see here, has to recognize which blaze pod is the target and basically hits it. So she's not instructed just to go side to side, but go in the direction of the target. So it's very reactive. And I think that's really important. And George made that point early on that the tests that he proved that were reliable were all reactive tests unanticipated types of movements opposed to anticipated types of movement or tests. And we use other devices too. So I, I know this is a blaze pod webinar, but just realize we can use other types of apparatus. As well. So now we go back to the, to the uh, reactive call. These are called, let me stop this for a second, just so I can kind of set this up. Here we go. So these are called hexo sticks. And these are three prong little devices with different colors, uh, three different colors. So actually what we're doing with this gentleman who literally just left a few minutes ago, we're crisscrossing our throws. So he has got a track. We call the color. He's got a catch with each side. So we might call the color a catch, or we may say not red or something else. So he's got to react to our verbal and then he's got to turn and hit the target blaze pot. So we're combining stimuluses, if you will, from a tracking visual standpoint to a reaction time, shoulder stabilization, and also the ability to move in space. That's tough. That's a tough cap. <laughs> yeah. Throwers. We know that throwers have a lot of mobility and many times they're challenged as far as controlling that and we work on strength and we work on dynamic stabilization work on scapular control core of the body proprioception all those things but i think a missing component as was talked about earlier is again training your neurocognitive system in these individuals so here's a exercise we like to do a lot of two pound ball throw up against the wall predetermined number of reps, basically stabilize. We may put them on a stability ball, bring the core of the body into the equation a little bit more, sustain hold on the opposite side. Now, what I'm asking him to do, I'll be quiet in a second. I'm asking him to count backwards as he does this. So all of a sudden, this particular task becomes a lot more focused. It's always funny when I ask somebody to either recite a color back or color sequence or numbers, how the intensity dramatically changes. Suddenly, it's, it's, it's still you know, fun, it's still, but it's all of a sudden the concentration and the focus is magnified. George, has that been your experience as well? Yes. I think by adding, as you said, uh, having them do multitasking simultaneously, I think that brings in so much more of the, not only the reactive response, but also the cognitive concentration 
to then have a reactive response simultaneously. And again, the whole purpose of this is uh, to try to mimic to some degree what's happening in sporting activities because sporting activities are sort of mass chaos, to be very frank, when you look at uh, the different activities. And uh, we can never really replicate in a clinic exactly what they do in the field or the pitch or the court. But nevertheless, the more we can kind of simulate it and uh, train them, I think the better off they're going to be in the transition back to practice, uh, competition, and then performance. Yeah, totally agree. And and they've got to be able to think when they're out there, you know, especially if they're a quarterback or a baseball pitcher like this guy. I mean, they've got so many things going on. And you know, yep. it is when we get distracted sometimes. You get three or four patients going, they're asking you what's next. <laughs> the ability to juggle, you know what I mean? It's the ability. And and then they ask you a question like, you remember that player 20 years ago? Who was his name? It's like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and the older you get, the little harder it is to remember all that. <laughs> that some of you might find out later in life. So try this. Uh, those who are on the uh, webinar, this is a great task to do is to tap at the same time of the throws. And we really like for them to get that ball going up against the wall. Moving pretty quick. He's counting backwards again. We tend to do a lot of the counting, but I do like reciting colors or sequences of names or, or anything that you like, just to bring in the brain into that particular aspect. Counting down by sevens from a hundred while doing this. Ready? Go. Nine three. Reverse. Six. Quick. Seventy nine. Seventy two. Good. So transitioning from some of the upper extremity stuff. Now looking at some things that can be done. Lower extremity. But notice also he's got to react to the ball. I don't know. Kevin probably has him counting backwards by a hundred. Uh, by sevens. Serial sevens. Of doing different types of drills Reverse. and he's calling out different movement Eight. patterns that he has Eight. to do, react to the ball, counting. So you can see the concentration and the reaction that this guy has. I mean, that's a stud athlete to begin with. <laughs> yeah, and he's a right ACL. Uh, and, you know, he's a really good athlete, to say the least. He did really well with his ACL. But even when we do this task, what's interesting is, you know, he did really well. But many times they'll come back like a guy like this and say, hey, let's do it that way. Let's bring in that component. Now, a takeoff of what Dr. Davey showed is the upper, upper extremity stability test uh, that Dr. Davey's taught us. That's why the tape is on the ground by his hands. So that's 36 inches apart, as he's alluded to and shown us uh, that particular testing. This is kind of how we started a couple years ago. We started with just a couple blaze pods to the side where they had to go back and forth with the same hand. Just seeing what kind of stabilization, how they move. And like anything else, as you do things, you start to expand. Expand the go, Lewis, go. make it more complicated. Here he's on a BOSU. This is one of the therapists. This is actually Louis Lipowitz, who's now practicing up in New York, but was a fellow here uh, about two years ago. And you can see Louis, you know, he's doing well with it, but it's a major, major challenge compared to this gymnast. <laughs> so it's interesting how, you know, the demand, she's rock solid on there. She's locked in, core of her body's not moving. We've got it almost like a diamond type shape, which I like a lot. And she has to react. We're really looking a lot at her scapula, posterior chain, and her glenohumeral joint, if it translates posteriorly. Sometimes we can have the person be mobile with it. So here she's planking elbows to the feet and just basically migrating or, or moving to the target itself. And, you know, again, what's great is it's so adaptable. It's so flexible that you can basically do whatever you like to do with the particular uh, blaze pod system. Here, what I've done with this gymnast is I have her hand on a piece of foam. She's got to stabilize and she also has to tap the targets. She's in a high plank position. That's actually a lot tougher than what it looks. Uh, some of these gymnasts are making it look really, really easy. <laughs> uh, but by far, as far as the, the core of the body, I think the gymnasts are some of the best on the planet. Showed these a couple of times. So I'm gonna go past this. 
Now we'll go, let me go back and just mention this. And I know we want to get into testing. Right. Um, Left. I have used right. tape like you right. see here right. on the ground. We do this Left. lower extremity Left. as well. We right. put tape on the ground. We might number the tape. Uh, in this case, she's just doing her hands back and forth, and I'll say right or left, and that's okay. And again, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, uh, this is a blaze pod sales pitch, but the difference between the numbers on tape and the lights are dramatically different. So I've used both, and the, the problem with just using tape on the ground and thinking you're getting the same effect is you don't get the distraction. You don't get the, the cognitive uh, discerning colors and so forth, or the configuration. With the numbers, you just locate the number and you go. You're not distracted by anything. Does that make sense? And I know, George, you've tried some other ways of doing neurocognitive. What are your feelings about like lights versus tape and numbers and even colors, just post-its? Sure. Well, obviously, old school things. We used to use tape before the blaze pods became available. And uh, as you said, you can call the numbers or have them do different uh, reactions to numbers or colors. But, and I've done that in the past, but as you said, particularly when you have multiple colors going, I think that's one of the better ways to do it. A simulating, once again, back to sport. If you're in a competition, multiple players, different color jerseys or different numbers. And I think that's the value of having multiple distractors versus say one thing where you call out a number and they have to react to just a single thing at one time. Uh, so I agree. I think the blaze pods has dramatically changed uh, the, the ability to be effective with some of the neurocognitive reactive training and testing. Let me go back to PowerPoint. I'm gonna switch to a different talk here, George. So just yeah. give me one second. If you'd like to say a few things more, that'd be great. Yeah, I think uh, some of the things that we talked about is again, uh, my mantra is test, don't guess. So even though we're seeing a lot of different types of, uh, uh, I'm gonna say functional activities and the neurocognitive activities, I think we have to, again, always make sure that we have reliable tests that we can use to assess the patient's progress through rehab and then ultimately to facilitate the clinical decision-making for return back to sport. Other things that I think that we brought up is, again, something that also, in addition to the neurocognitive response that's been overlooked, is number two, is to uh, think about the contralateral overflow or the cross-education effect. And then thirdly, is the endurance or the fatigue factor. I think there are two things that we really haven't addressed adequately yet in rehab. So just some things, again, part of the webinar is also not only to answer some questions, but certainly to raise a lot more and get everybody doing more critical thinking so we can all learn and share information from each other. I want to Guys, show, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, George, by the way. I mean, totally spot on. Um, thanks for a great summarization and also things to think about. I'm going to show a few more things related to the lower extremity. I know we're the time's flying by. Uh, so I'm only going to go for about five, seven more minutes. That way we've got about five, 10 minutes of time for questions. So I, I know there's going to be questions. So I definitely want to address that. So, you know, when we talk about uh, the lower extremity, one thing I do want to mention is the article uh, that George and I um, uh, wrote, American Journal of Sports Medicine, came out earlier this year, where we said there's a need to change the way we test. And you know, we do T runs and L runs and hop tests, and those are fantastic tests, but is it really, am I really going to return someone to play based on a hop test when they have to go out there and react and do anticipated movements? And we know in the world of soccer, the most common way people get hurt is when they're, when they're going for a ball and it's mm -hmm. kind of this unanticipated type of movement. It's a perturbation. They get jostled and so forth. So the idea of this particular article, which I think, you know, again, I think we did a, a decent job trying to lay the groundwork to say the least, is to say, hey, let's do something where we set up like a T run and their blaze pods and they can run and tap the, right, the blaze pod right when they're ready to make a cut. And then they go to the lateral one, tap it, 
go to the opposite side, tap it, and then finish the T. And what the blades pods allow us to do is make it reactive so they don't know which direction they're going to go in until they get there, until they tap. So that's great. But it also gives us the timing mechanism from one pod to the other. So it's an objective, objective test. Now, it's nice to use a stopwatch and say, well, you did it within 11 seconds. But what about from one, one site or one point to another? So the blades pods work fantastically. So we've always done some of this perturbation stuff like you see. Yes, here. yes, I like it. But look at look at this guy. This Bastard. guy's a soccer Bastard. player. He's actually a oh, professional right ACL. You can do this. There you go. He's going down, Ryan. He's going down. Foot fire. And he's tapping the, the target he's at the same record. time. Come on, fast. And I know some go of the go. colors go. don't show up go. Go on videos because of lighting in the clinic. There's also a distraction go. color. So you do that for 30 seconds or one minute straight. That you is got a it. You tough, got it. Come on. tough exercise. We do a lot of this. And this is actually one of the tests that I do in the clinic. Blades pods are set up, distracting colors as well as targets, and he's moving laterally. He's got to catch a ball, he's got to locate the target color, ignore the distraction color, but the whole time maintain good knee stability, speed. And again, the first thing a guy like this is going to ask me, what did I get? <laughs> he knows his yeah. That's the other thing I'd say is a person like that who's done it numerous times will actually any people I deal with, they know what they had last time. They know what their personal best is, by the way. And it's interesting to me how, how motivational it is. Here's that same position. And what Zach and Doc are doing is they're tapping the blaze pod target. So we have two different systems set up. So in this case, we needed two um, iPads or two phones where we have the app running. And they're both counting backwards, by the way. So Zach is counting one number, so he'll say like 93, and then Doc will do the next number by seven. And they go back and forth counting, but the whole time looking for the target and tapping the target while passing the soccer ball. That's a lot going on. And as you as trainers and you as therapists and so forth, that would be engaging for you as well from a rehab standpoint <laughs> two soccer balls so we like this is only one set of blaze pods here with four lights so we have two balls so the minute one ball gets kicked the other ball is released so it's really tough i mean they got a lot going on and we do a lot of this we do it with throws as well as catches and so forth there are a lot of blaze pods going a lot of colors <laughs> one only one target color though Kevin, I want to interject a, a question here because yeah, it's a, ahead, it sure. seems apt based on, oh, oh, look, who is that? He got confused. Yeah, he got all shook. <laughs> uh, one of the questions, and I'll kind of format in my own words, um, but uh, in, in these, uh, due to kind of the neurological stress of all of these complexities and open skill drills, how many would you recommend? What's a recommended dosage that's not going to cause uh, I guess like too much uh, neurological fatigue or start to be too much for somebody. Do you have any parameters that, you know, talk about, I guess, uh, or what's your structure, I guess. Yeah. So for me, I, you know, I, 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 and actually I want to uh, hear what George's comments are as well. For me, when I'm looking at neurocognitive as well as neuromuscular control, we look at the movements, we look at fatigue factors, we look at different circumstances, where they're at in their recovery. So for me, it's, it's, I'm in the rehab world, so I look at where they're at in their rehabilitation. If I know that neurocognitive is an issue, and what I mean by that is inability to contract, like a quad after an ACL, that's something I start with, with their rehab. So I do specific training that I hope, hope to get to in a minute. Uh, as far as trying to get sensory uh, input. And then they'll do some traditional strengthening and maybe some balance and neuromuscular. And then I always end with neurocognitive. So I start and I finish. Whereas a person like this, this football player is doing really well and we're just adding on a task. I almost always do it at the end or toward the end when they're fatigued a little bit, because I want to see how they move in a more fatigued state. Because I think like we talked about earlier, Michael, I think that's when they are most vulnerable. 
George, what's your thoughts? I totally agree. I think it's the qualitative assessment of, as Kevin just said, the movement, particularly in a fatigue state, as I just stated a little while ago, besides the neurocognitive effects, we have to look at this whole concept of contralateral or cross-education overflow and the fatigue factor. And there's very little objective testing, particularly of the upper extremity in a fatigued state. And uh, it's something that we're missing. And there's no testing, of neurocognitive testing in a fatigued state of the upper extremity. So there are some things that, again, that we need to deal with in the, uh, in the future. No, great points. You know, everybody uses, well, not everybody, but a lot of people use the Y balance test, which again is a good test. I don't really have a problem with it other than it's not dynamic enough for me, but I think for a level of looking at dynamic stability and movement. So here we've got it set up like a V, but I've even done Y with it. This makes it more reactive. So she's got to stabilize on that stabilizing side. Meanwhile, tap the lights. Now, again, this doesn't look like much until you have an ACL problem or patellofemoral <laughs> instability. And it's very challenging. Look at it. I mean, she is focused in, by the way. She's locked in on that task. And that's really what you want in rehab, by the way. You want your person locked in, getting the effects of training. And I do want to get to um, no, skip over a couple of these. I, I want to make sure we get to some things that can be done right after injury. So let me skip a couple of these right, real fast. I'm sorry. I thought I could get to different points. Um, got a lot of videos to say the least. So what do we do right after injury? Because people say all these drills are great, but they're really not that I can do after an ACL surgery or things I can't do right after an injury. So what we're doing here is just the timing mechanism. And we all know sometimes these patients just zip through their exercises. So now what we set up is no real neurocognitive other than the timing. We wanna make sure they do a sustained contraction slow on the way down, really emphasizing eccentrics. So now the blaze pod is really used for strengthening, muscle activation and strengthening. Now we added in some distraction colors. So now he can hit the target that lights up and he has to react. Again, this would be somebody who just got injured, you know, maybe a day or two post injury, day or two after surgery. Here now what we're doing is combining open kinetic chain knee extension. I love this exercise, by the way. And there's numerous ways of doing it. Here he's just hitting the target color. But what he's doing, if you watch closely, he's hitting blue and he's also hitting red. Red with right, left with blue. And so we tell him he can hit with either side. Now look at this gentleman. You see what he did? Kind of confused. He's an ACL reconstruction. He's 72 years old. Super active skiing, he's a pilot's license, but I'm gonna start it over and watch what happens when the lights light up with him. See what I mean? There's a little bit of a sensory, sensory type of overload. Now he's starting to get the hang of it. And, and let me say a couple things about this. We can do different colors. We can tell them, hey, blue is your target, hit with either hand. We can ask them to do a delay, hold up at the top with their leg. We can have them count, talk at the same time. So one thing I like to do with a particular exercise is they do the exercise, they get it down, then we add in more and more complexity as they master it. So we're constantly trying to challenge them along the way. And you know what, he loves it. This guy just got into it. He goes that way, you know, when I'm in the cockpit, I got a lot going on. I want to get that back because I almost feel like I lost it after the injury because I can't fly. He couldn't fly yep. the plane for several months because, you know, he can't get in the cockpit. Private planes, he kind of, you know, it's really tight. The other thing that's interesting about this is if you notice, and there is some evidence that shows if you have a lower extremity injury and actually train the upper extremity, that there's also a facilitatory type of an effect. Conversely, if you have an upper extremity injury and you train the lower extremity, then there is some limited evidence that shows that, uh, again, there's a positive response. So whether, you know, once again, that can't be a muscular response as much as it's a neurocognitive response. And that just further goes to show the importance of the whole concept 
of uh, what we're trying to describe now versus even just a few years ago. As Kevin indicated, that article we published in 2020, it almost seems prehistoric to me now when we look at what we do now compared to what we did even just a few years ago based on what we've been learning and some of the new technology that we have available. Yeah, I mean, it's just taking off. It's just flying. The technology, uh, the innovation is just unbelievably quick. Let me show two more videos, and I've got a ton of them, but I know we're running out of time, and I want to be able to answer any questions. Yeah, so we got a few questions and about five minutes left. So here he's going through the ladder, and he's got to tap the target. No distracting colors, so this is a timing mechanism on the blaze pods that I'm using here. Now, I can do distracting colors, and I can do reactive. It's just where he's at in his recovery, it wasn't really appropriate for him to do big time cutting one side to the other. This is a guy immediately post-op, ACL, as you can see, he's still using a uh, crutch. We like to do stepping over cones because it forces them to bend their knee, spend time on that side that's weight carrying. This guy's NFL, NFL player, I mean, doing this, and you can see the level of engagement. All we're trying to do here is get him moving, get him to bend his knee, stabilize on that leg, tap the light, and we can make it reactive as well. So the blades pods can be used immediately after injury all the way to advanced stage. And I wanted to show some of this because I just don't want people to think that this is all advanced rehab stuff. So here's a gentleman, this will be the last one I'll show because again, I, I know we wanna have some dialogue He's three days after his ACL. We do this all the time. We'll put a couple of blaze pods around. He's got to stabilize. I'll have him close his eyes at first, and then I'll say, go. He's got to locate the light, tap it, close his eyes again. I'll say, go. He's got to tap the light. We just go back and forth. I don't have a video of it, unfortunately, but I wanted just to show that setup. So, Michael, with that, I, again, I know we're running out of time quickly, and I apologize for that, but... Uh, Wish I could show more with the testing. I, I had a whole talk on that, but time that, flew that's, by. What, what, that's that's going to be one of the questions that uh, that our attendees have. Um, this one kind of uh, goes back to uh, what we were talking about earlier with um, kind of the programming, um, if I can call it that. Um, it says, are you performing the Blaze Pot te test weekly? Uh, and this is for the Blaze Pot test weekly, biweekly, uh, or monthly in the in in your clinic or in the clinic. Yeah, for me, uh, I usually space them out a bit. So I don't usually test weekly. I'll test every couple weeks. Um, if we talk, you know, upper extremity, if it's an athlete who has shoulder instability, for instance, like with some of our tests functionally, I will test every week because it's so quick to return them back after an episode. But after surgery, I space them out. If it's a thrower, it's usually a milestone. Can you start throwing? Can you progress off the mound? Can you go to competition or inner squad games? ACLs, it's usually about three to four weeks. But one thing I will say, and I'll hand it over to George, because every episode I get a score, it's almost like I'm testing them every time anyway. Does that make sense? So I'm getting data every time there is a exposure, which I like a lot because I'm a data guy too. And the patients remember that, as you said, they know what their last score was and the next time in, they want to beat it. But uh, again, when you look at uh, testing for muscle strength, there is a study in AJSM by Bowden, and they showed that from a strength standpoint, like doing something like a biodex test, that you shouldn't test more than usually six or eight weeks uh, to find a really significant change. But again, we're not talking about just strength anymore. We're talking about the neurocognitive response. So as Kevin said, essentially almost every time, even though you may not be recording it yourself, those patients know how they've done. So uh, I would say the same thing, that at least every few weeks, you would wanna try to uh, use the blaze pods as a test, don't guess, so you know how the patient is progressing. Also, awesome. in my experience have been the neurocognitive gains are much faster than muscle return. It, awesome. this, it accelerates tremendously yeah. quick. And we tell patients that, and they even see it hey, I'm, I'm so much better on my involved side. You know, many times they call it good leg, bad leg. And it's like, hey, I'm better on my bad leg, you know, when they're balancing and using blaze pods. And I say, that's, that's what I expect out of you. Because you're doing so much, I expect you to be better on your involved side. 
and and stop saying it's bad leg by the way don't use that <laughs> word. they're both good legs that's right um so, uh, w in, in which pathologies um could the blaze pod would you recommend the blaze pods not be used oh boy there isn't one i can think of i mean i use it i use it for everything i use it total hip patients total knee patients um concussion yeah. yeah everything i guess the only one i could potentially even think of is if a patient had previous seizures mm. that with the multiple lights particularly in the open chain fashion or something could be a factor i have no idea though that's the only thing that comes to mind to me as a yeah, patient a has point. a history of seizures i i've had two people here with the strobe glasses that had a seizure as a result, but they've oh, done wow. ice pods and haven't had a problem now. So okay. I think strobing is different. Yeah, but I yeah, but I think that's Good a great point. point, George. Something to think about. Yeah, I like that question. Um, so it, to let everybody know, uh, what I like about blaze pod is a lot of the things that that uh dr wilk and dr davies have talked about like blaze pod has inc incorporated in analytics and metrics that that you guys could use to further test so they're constantly changing based on the needs of of the the quote-unquote customer which i think is 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 pretty cool um just a couple other questions and a lot of a lot of people who are out there kind of want to you know, a lot of respect for you guys and kind of want to be in your head a little bit more. And so one of them, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> a question is, can the DOI of the reference materials please be shared outside of the presentation? Um, the RTP guidelines would be awesome to download and review. Yeah, was, yeah, was sure. one yeah, I don't um, have a problem with that. Yeah, several of the, the articles that we cited are in IJSPT, which is an open access journal. So again, you can just put in the last names and uh, then uh, that will show up and it's open access. So it's free to download the hard copies or e-copies of the articles. It's one of the reasons I think it's important, frankly, to publish in a journal like IJSPT. It's open access and lets everyone have access to the information. Awesome. Uh, there's a couple people who were uh they didn't like the fast forward into those videos because they were just taking them in and so <laughs> the, the, the question is um okay. is there a, yeah. a way to re-watch the full presentation i know that we are going to record this and put it up but uh you know you're you're pretty famous and what you guys are doing is pretty yeah. awesome and yeah. really helping out a lot of pts out there um you, we could probably do that right yeah. kevin we can and, and george get those get the full presentations and and and, and post them on uh youtube or through the blaze pot academy or something like that well the fast movements were obviously in the terminal phases of rehab where you're doing quick things like that to make it uh sport specific <laughs> so it's no, yeah it's on kevin, you guys for not for not tell having about your instagram yeah so you know a lot of the videos i showed are on my instagram i mean i there's probably a couple thousand uh, videos total, probably 20, well, probably more than that, probably 40% are on BlazePod, believe it or not. Matter of fact, I posted something today and yesterday, both were BlazePod type movements, pretty unique. But uh, yeah, Mike, I, I, Michael, I, I, we can make something available like that. I mean, I, I felt bad, like I said, I loaded up a lot of videos in the last couple of days. What I, I feel bad about is we didn't get to the testing, the reactive testing, I tried to describe it. But it's really interesting to see T runs, L runs, and hop tests with the blaze pod. So, you know, maybe uh, we can make those videos available, or you know, we'll we'll talk about it again uh, in another webinar or something. Yeah, we'll we'll figure that out. And I, right. I, I feel like you guys just volunteered for another webinar in a couple months, so appreciate that. Um, the the last one. Um, do, uh, do you guys have a handout with descriptions on testing protocols? Uh, uh, for for the UEC, uh, CKC, and OKC, uh, and the ASH test, et cetera? Yeah, those articles, uh, those two posters were presented at CSM, and one of them actually was an award-winning poster. Out of the 1,200 posters that were there, one of them became one of the top 10 posters 
had to go through an additional review process and an interview process. I didn't win the blue ribbon, but it's pretty nice to be recognized as one of the top 10 out of 1,200. But nevertheless, uh, uh, we do have that available and uh, we're in the process of writing those up. So again, because of copyright, when you basically uh, give the uh, copyright to a journal, you can't distribute everything, but uh, I can share the posters and uh, that, that has some relevance. So Michael, you and I can deal with that later. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll put it up. And as um, far as our upper extremity tests, as far as the setup for blaze pods and also the lower extremity, we do have that written up and I can make that available. Absolutely. Some of that's published, Kevin. I think the right. uh, most recent publications uh, have demonstrated some of that for the lower extremity, the 2020, or the, uh, the most recent one. And uh, we have the one coming out with Zach with 170, was it subjects or yeah, something like that? And the right. Well, at any rate, we have some of that stuff coming out. Awesome. I, uh, I can't thank you enough. We're, we're at time. Um, literally hundreds of people stayed on the entire time, which I really haven't seen before. So uh, from, you know, me personally, I know Simon personally, Farber, our, our team, and uh, certainly the extended team blaze pod really want to thank you guys for just everything you've done. And, and like, for me, I went to PT school and uh, wasn't in my cards and so didn't finish it, but I got into it to help people. And by the way you guys present and your demeanor and everyone you're helping, that to me is like, that's awesome. I just want to thank you. And in, in, in behalf of all the physical therapists out there too, thank you for what you guys do and and helping you know lead this great industry and this this charge and this message uh, and then from blaze pod we're so grateful for you guys for everything that you've done to help um us spread this this cool tool that you guys have you know really done some amazing things with that we didn't know that it had that potential um you know it, we, it was created to help burn calories for overweight kids on a playground <laughs> and and it, and now to see it uh flourish in this the medical field has just been awesome and that's really thanks to you guys so i don't want to take uh any more of your time um and we'll work out some of those question uh details later uh what we post and how we post and share it on the blaze pot academy blaze pot academy is also a resource for all of these webinars and a lot of other research studies that these two gentlemen have done um, a lot of things we're posting there uh we're currently in process of rebuilding our physical therapy page and so you guys have given some great sound bites that uh <laughs> i know the team will be um you know utilizing that information to do that and then as far as the blade uh, the testing goes that you were mentioning we will we'll we'll attack that another time so uh thank you guys so much for everything and um thank you for happy, the kind invitation yeah it was great uh, happy it. happy 4th of July appreciate you guys yeah. happy 4th of July at all happy 4th yep. everybody stay safe enjoy yep. it thanks michael for setting all this right, up thank you George, it was great thank you so much thanks you got it. It.